Okay, everybody. Thanks for coming to my uh, lovely session. Um, it's a first time session for me about web components, a front end topic. Normal, normally, I more talk about back end stuff or server stuff or whatever stuff, um, but front end is completely new. Um, my name is uh, David. I'm uh, from Germany, from a lovely city called uh, Cologne. Um, yeah, it's not really lovely, but um, it's actually pretty awful. Never go to Cologne from an architectural perspective. Um, uh, and I'm a, a long-term Joomla community member. Um, I joined Joomla back in Mambo days, uh, and since then, I'm pretty much uh, stayed there where I am now. Um, I'm a member of the CLT. I'm a member of the automated testing team. And uh, for living in the real world, I am a freelance web developer. And um, yeah, I'm talking about a problem that we have right now because uh, we pretty much fucked up the web. Um, modern days web is broken um, because we have all those fancy tools. We have front end frameworks for JavaScript, for CSS, for whatever. Um, and in the very moment you combine two of those, it breaks. You have conflicts everywhere. Um, some Conflicts aren't that bad. For example, combining AngularJS and jQuery works quite well, but combining, I don't know, Bootstrap 2 and Bootstrap 3 from time to time uh, tends to cause some problems. Um, and even worse, um, we lack some proper APIs. Um, for example, if you want to include a Google map, it looks like this. Um, you have this new and some, some parameters. You're working with get element by ID, which is the native JavaScript API. And when you're using jQuery, the API looks completely different. Different method names. It's just a, a different world. Um, and that really can drive people crazy, right? Um, and so some, some people that are way smarter than me uh, developed a vision. Um, that's the, the vision of web components. Um, and in my little example, um, this is what the Google map that we saw in the first slide would look like in a web components world. Um, you have one part, which is the actual import. It's like loading this Google map plugin. And to actual display the, the map and uh, pass all the attributes and parameters, you just use a simple HTML tag with attributes. And um, that's making life a lot easier because uh, you don't need any new knowledge. People know how to use HTML. Add some attributes and you're done. Um, and to make it even better, in the web components world, stuff is encapsulated. It's isolated from each other. So when our Google Map plugin uses foundation a CSS framework to uh, display the stuff on the map and have some fancy pop-ups. It doesn't interfere with the Bootstrap 2 of the site where this Google Map plugin is embedded. Same applies to JavaScript and also markup and all kinds of things, just isolated. And to make it even better, it's possible to nest those things. We added another plugin. In this case, it's a Lightbox plugin. And if we want to display a Google map in a light box, we just nest them. That's how HTML works, right? That makes a happy developer. Um, but I think uh, it makes sense to, to explain some building blocks of how this works first. Um, the first building blocks are custom elements. Um, right now, if you create a new HTML tag, in, in, uh, in an HTML document, call it foobar or something, um, you will be able to style it and um, the browser doesn't complain about it. Just, it, it, it is an empty tag and if you put some text in there, it even displays the text. Um, but uh, if you only define the HTML tag in the actual markup, uh, you have a problem when it comes to uh, JavaScript because you're not able to interact with this new tag um, in, a, in a proper way, all the APIs are missing, this kind of stuff. Um, and so you need some, some uh, JavaScript um, to register this new tag. In this case, it's x minus foo. Um, and you tell it uh, that x minus foo um, should be an ancestor of the 
default HTML element. You could also use a different object here, for example, uh, HTML element paragraph, if you want it to be a child of a paragraph or use an input element or whatever. Um, one thing that is quite important is the dash in between. Um, in, uh, in the web components world, our custom tags require a dash somewhere because that's the way of telling the browser that this is our own custom element. The next building block are HTML templates. Um, we have a template tag up there, um, and if you copy and paste this block into your browser, um, nothing happens by default because the stuff that's in the HTML tag, uh, in the template tag, is displayed. Um, it's hidden markup, but uh, you can read the content of this hidden markup with JavaScript and use it. And for example, use some placeholder um, to actually render the stuff. Um, and in this case, that's what I'm doing here. I'm uh, getting the content of this template tag, and uh, with a, a, a little loop, um, I will replace the number placeholder with numbers from one to three. Um, and so if you execute the stuff, it actually renders I'm paragraph number one, two, three. So very convenient way of storing some markup um, in, the, in, the, in the DOM tree without displaying it and using it multiple times. Next building block is the shadow DOM. Um, actually, that's already there in browsers and it's widely used. Um, it's a, an, an, a document tree, so HTML, CSS, JavaScript, um, within our document um, and this, this tree, this new tree, is hidden from us, so we can't see it, it's in the shadow. Um, a very good example is the native HTML video tag. Um, if, you, you, if you're using the video tag in your browser, it actually um, uses plain CSS and HTML to render those fancy views. Um, all those elements, uh, those control elements, are actually mostly diff containers just styled in a proper way. And to hide this actual implementation, for example, that the, uh, the uh, arrow looks like this arrow, is hidden from us as developers by moving it into a shadow DOM. Um, and even more, by moving it into the shadow DOM, um, it's, uh, it doesn't interfere anymore with the CSS that we use in our main tree. So we have isolation. There are some more examples of uh, those uh, native elements that are using Shadow DOM. Um, audio is one of them. Uh, input type range is another one, and there are quite a few in modern days browsers that are using this stuff. Um, and last but not least, we have the HTML imports. Um, those are uh, quite simple. Uh, you put them in the head of your document. Um, and you uh, refer to another HTML document, and this document then gets included into your main document, but it isn't displayed. So it's, it behaves some kind of like the template tag we had earlier before. Um, it's stored somewhere in the DOM tree. It's accessible for, the, uh, for uh, JavaScript to read the stuff that's in there. Um, and uh, if you, for example, if we have some, some uh, CSS and uh, JS dependencies in this HTML file that we include, um, this CSS and JavaScript is loaded in the background, so all resources are retrieved. Um, the main advantage of this is that uh, to include uh, a plugin, a snippet, a widget, or whatever, you only require one line of code, and it's different than uh, than what we had so far where you had to include at least one JavaScript and a CSS and a extended CSS and I don't know, whatever, just one line. Um, and so when we start putting those blocks together, um, we get web components. Web components is not one single technology, but it's built out of this building blocks. Um, we have the template tag, which has our the, the markup that we are using for our widget. For example, in the when we come back to the uh, Google Maps example, we would have probably just an empty div container because that's all what the Google Map API needs. 
So that would be in the template tag. Um, we have the shadow DOM because uh, that's what we need uh, to hide the, our, our widget um, from our main document so we don't have all those problems with uh, JavaScript uh, conflicts and CSS overwriting each other. Um, and last but not least, we have those custom elements to all put them in a nice and handy HTML tag. Um, but there's a downside which is called reality. <laughs> um, browser support isn't that great. For, for HTML template, it's okay, of course, IE doesn't do it, um, but the rest doesn't look too bad. Um, when it comes to Shadow DOM, it gets worse because, for example, in, uh, in Firefox, it's not enabled by default. IE, of course, can't do it. Safari can't do it either. On mobile, it's worse. Um, same for uh, custom elements. It's all the same. Uh, so, where's the cool stuff? But there's light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and this light is a library called uh, Polymer. And um, this library is built by, um, I think by Google, at least there are quite a few of Google employees involved in that. And um, what I'm doing next is I'm showing you how to actually implement web components, how to put all those building blocks together in real world. But <laughs> um, Google released a new version this week, so everything I tell you is already outdated. Thank you, Google. <laughs> yeah. Um, Polymer itself consists of three parts. Um, the, uh, there's one bunch of libraries, uh, the web components polyfill. Um, that's the part that it's required um, to make IE work, basically, and all those other browsers. It's a, a, a whole shitload of JavaScript to make those older browsers work with all those new fancy stuff. Um, the Polymer library itself, uh, that's a JavaScript library that you can use uh, to build those custom elements. You could also do this by hand, but with Polymer it's much easier. And um, last but not least, there's the Polymer Elements, um, which is uh, some sort of library um, where you can grab some ready-to-use custom elements from. Polymer, they, they have a, a bunch of example elements that you can use um, to build your own stuff. For example, they have all kinds of UI elements, um, some basic functionality, we'll see this later, um, and all those kinds of stuff, we can take a look at this. And um, with Polymer browser supports, browser support is, is okay so far. Um, there are some glitches in uh, IE10, that's why there's this uh, crazy sign, um, but for normal stuff, it works quite well. So it's actually ready to use technology. Um, uh, but now, some live demo, the part that breaks. Um, I prepared, oh yeah, sorry, I need to see something, right? Um, I prepared a little example for you, which is a website that displays the current temperature in three different, uh, two different cities, but in three different ways. Um, if we take a look at the actual code of this site, it's large enough. No, better. Um, we have the head with all the normal stuff. I use Bootstrap to make it look fancy, um, and also to to show you that there aren't no conflicts. Um, jQuery is used. This is the fun part. Um, this is where we include the uh, the web components polyfill that's required in order to make the old browsers work. And I'm importing uh, my example elements that I will use later on. Those are in a subfolder. Um, and so the old way of doing stuff would look like this. Um, we would have a, an, a div class. The, the name of the city would be hard-coded. Um, and you'll have an empty placeholder for the temperature to get in there and an empty placeholder for the description to put in. And then we are using jQuery. In this case, even in no conflict mode, never, never do this in Joomla world, it explodes. Um, to grab uh, the weather data from an API, pass the city, 
along. Um, and uh, if the API responds, we take the temperature and the description and uh, put them in our both placeholder tags. That's the old way of doing it. Now comes the new fancy way, which looks like this in my example. You just have one tag, in this case, local minus weather, and an attribute city. And in this attribute, I pass the name of the city where I want to retrieve the weather for. Um, you notice the dash in between, as I mentioned, that's required for custom elements because otherwise they don't work. Um, and if we take a look at the, you know, it's, remember it's important right here, elements, local minus weather.html. If we take a look at this file, it looks like this. Um, we need to import the uh, Polymer library in order to have all those necessary requirements. This is the first call. Um, and then we have a element to define an element. <laughs> um, it's a Polymer element uh, with the name of the element that we would like to define now. Um, and we can pass along a list of attributes. I think they are comma separated in this old version and the new version. It's definitely different. Um, and our element pretty much consists of two parts. Um, we have one template tag, which holds our actual markup. In this case, we are working with proper placeholders, not just empty spans. Um, and I have some style in there to show you that it doesn't interfere with the styles of the parent document. They're completely separated from each other. Um, and I move the jQuery code that we had in the main document over here. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much the same, retrieving data and applying it. Um, and it works. It actually works really well. Um, if I just copy this one and do uh, New York and hit save, it's retrieving the weather for New York. And if I get in here, that's the main document and tell it that uh, dot weather is supposed to be red. It's only changing the one in the parent document. And the ones that we import aren't affected. And either way, if we remove this one, the uh, parent one isn't affected by the styles in our custom elements. Isolation. No more conflicts. Um, but the way I've shown here with using jQuery isn't the, the, the polymer way of doing stuff. Um, the better way, that's also the reason why we have a, a better weather custom element down here, um, looks like this. Again, we have the call to load polymer, and we're using one of those ready-to-use elements that Polymer ships. Um, in this case, it's an, uh, an element to do Ajax calls. Um, this part here is the same. We define the name, we have the markup, and down here comes the fun part. Um, Polymer provides us an HTML tag to do Ajax calls. Pass along the URL, um, the query parameters, and we tell the tag to um, append the uh, response of this call to this placeholder. So we have the data up here. And there are lots and lots of those ready to use components in Polymer, which makes life a lot easier. And by the way, we also got rid of jQuery. That also makes a kitten happy. And uh, yeah, Peter. How could you, uh, how would you You would probably display the, the output, the error message within the template tag up here. So uh, you, can do, um, you can do all those normal if stuff. If something breaks, then display this message down here. Um, the only thing that you can't do is uh, that you can't bubble up 
in the DOM tree of the parent document and, for example, trigger an alert or change the color of something because it's isolated. So you need to do the error handling in your custom element. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, here comes the fun part. Um, from the perspective of the main document, from the parent document, if I would click on my custom element, it triggers a click. And if I um, take a look at the event data, then it will show me that the tag local minus weather has been clicked on. What I can't do is find out on which tag within the local minus weather tag it has been clicked on. Because again, it's in the shadow dome, it's isolated, so you can't take a look in there. Um, also, uh, the, 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 um, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. So, back to my presentation. Two remaining slides. So this is how web components work. Custom elements all run in isolation, one line of code, easy to combine stuff. Um, actually, it's a pretty nice stuff, um, but there are some downsides too. Um, the real downside is that uh, this JS, ISO, this JavaScript isolation doesn't really work, at least right now, um, because as I said, uh, if you do the actual import of your custom tag and you have a script tag in there, um, it loads this JavaScript. For example, if we have a, in our parent document, we have uh, Mutools, and in one of our custom tags, we use jQuery. Um, the uh, jQuery uh, is retrieved from the server and they're all executed in the same context. So we still need namespacing for JavaScript in order to avoid those conflicts. JavaScript is still a pain. Um, but it works perfectly well for, for CSS, and it resolves at least some of those JavaScript conflicts when it comes to event handling and uh, uh, working in, uh, with uh, global variables and this kind of things. It solves a part of it, but not the whole thing. Um, and um, it has quite a big of a performance impact, if you think about it, because um, when we, for example, uh, we, in our main document, we include um, a Google Map element. And this Google Map element then has to be retrieved from the server. And after it's retrieved, we, we start grabbing its dependencies. And if we have those dependencies, we start the, to retrieve the dependencies of this document. So right now, we, you, you know, we, we're trying to avoid multiple calls. We want to do as least requests as possible. And web components partly work the exact other way around, because it's one after another and another. Um, and it's, it's pretty new stuff. Um, you won't find that much documentation right now. Um, you will not find those much real world examples using it. The, the only one that I stumbled upon was uh, GitHub. Um, they are using a custom HTML tag to display the uh, this line. Uh, this file has been edited the last time eight days ago. They have a modified minus last custom tag. Um, that's the only real-world example that I have found. Um, but web components start to become a real big topic. It's definitely worth watching them. It's definitely worth taking a closer look on them. Um, and I think they, they can help, at least at a, in a, at a few places. Um, this Google Map example is a great one, but this could be helpful. Um, it might be helpful when it comes to all sorts of sliders and uh, accordions and galleries and whatever, because you can nest them and those kind of things. Um, yeah, so take a closer look on it. That's my conclusion right now. Any other questions?
Ja. Ja. Um, if you create a shadow DOM yourself, and that's what, what Polymer does, it, it, the, those elements behave a bit different um, than uh, the native shadow DOM elements like uh, the video tag does. Um, and so you can ex uh, inspect them with the developer tools of your browser. Oh, oh you don't see it. Yeah, this way it's much more useful. For example, in Chrome, you have the, the shadow root, and then you can inspect all the child elements. You see which CSS is loaded and applied, and what happens. So that works, um, but of course only for the shadow DOM elements that you use yourself. Anything else? It's it's because of. Uh, how web components are, are built. Um, when it comes to, to, to JavaScript, they all uh, loaded in the in the same uh, in the same process in the same thread, um, and so they have the possibility to co to conflict with each other. Um, and that's not going to change. It's going to stay that way. So write proper JavaScript, namespace stuff. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, so. Uh, the 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 polymer um, those ready to use elements um, they don't have any third party dependencies, no conflicts. Um, so this works quite well. This won't cause any issues. That's the way to do it. Yeah, that's quite easy. Um, in fact, I, I would just have to distribute my single HTML file. Upload it somewhere, tell people to download it, put it on their local server, and add this one import statement. And of course, they they they, they would have to load the uh, the actual web components polyfill before, because otherwise, IA cries. So it makes life a lot easier, hopefully. Okay, so thank you, everybody. And now, go out and play with it. <laughs> <laughs>